Welcome to the IoT Podcast Show. I'm your host, Tom White. Today, I am joined in person, finally, by Ronnie Cohen. Ronnie Cohen is the Director, Head of Strategy, Business Development at FlowLive, a connectivity provider offering a full suite of global cellular connectivity services for the IoT industry. Welcome to the show, Ronnie. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. It feels strange actually seeing someone in real life doing this show because uh, I think the last time we did this, it was in 2019. Uh, So everything's been done virtually since then. So thank you so much for coming in. Well, that's great. I'm happy I'm the first one. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Ronnie, can we start by just explaining, for for you to explain just a little bit about your background in telecoms and, and IoT and how you got into this crazy world? Uh, I started uh, sort of in 1999 with my first company around uh, text messages when everybody was sort of just kind of figuring out what text messages are. They didn't know okay. they had them on their phones. And I've been in the industry since then, uh, sort of 20, 20 odd years. Uh, really all around cellular connectivity. It was a text messaging and then a little bit of stint in voice over IP for the software. The software side of uh, of uh, switching environments and mm. voice over IP, but uh, really in 2011, I I really started looking into into the IoT market. I was in uh, I remember being at the at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona in 2011, and really looking at the the Intel had a booth and it was called the the uh, the machine to machine booth and it was kind of the size of a small room right and i think that was practically the whole of the the machine to machine industry okay and i had a little walk around and i thought this is it you know no annoying humans calling up <laughs> no <laughs> device, you know yeah. these uh this industry is really interesting it's, it's this you know, everything's going to be connected and i kind of had a feeling that there's there was an edge to to the IoT industry at this mm. stage. There was an edge that obviously IoT had not been uh, coined, the term had not been coined yet. There's various versions of uh, IoT, IOE, there's different things. Uh, at, you know, it was an industry that was already, the reality is it was an industry that already existed mm. in, uh, you know, in, in, in a way. Uh, however, it was suddenly sort of it found sort of an explosion. There was something about to happen, which I think, in a way, we've been waiting for it for a while. Yeah. But it's, it's happening now. Uh, so really, uh, I started uh, looking into that and very much getting uh, involved in the industry in, in 2012, 13, uh, but only in 2015 started to flow. Okay. And this is where we, you know, we all got together with many people that I came about from people that I knew from the industry and the, I think with Flo the best of uh, all the people that I've ever met uh, came together and in 2016 uh, we started forming the, the business and started forming the, uh, the infrastructure and understanding where we want to go from there. Yeah, fantastic. I mean it's, it's interesting you should say that you started in text messages because of course text messages were originally service messages weren't they for engineers and operators never yes. thought that they'd take off, right? Um, and, and here we are, fast forward, you know, 10 years later and uh, we're in this crazy world of everything being connected. And the text messages are sort of slowly dying down again, yeah. you know. It's I become full circle. I think we're, uh, if anybody gets a text message today, it's usually something they don't want to open. Or yeah, yeah. You know, or it's some, uh, they're getting a pizza deal. Yeah, or something. yeah, yeah. So uh, we, yeah, text messages were very interesting, actually. It was, uh, it was sort of a, by, a byproduct. Mm. And, but yeah, that's how we started. However, you know, we in the IoT market, we're still using very much the the, the text messages, the you know, the uh, the natural sort of still the basic SMS is very important yeah. as a configuration message, mm. pretty much where it was intended to uh, yeah. in the first place. Yeah, and it yeah. still needs to be a configuration message you know, yeah. for devices. And yeah, like that. yeah, so indeed. By the by, yeah, it's still relevant. Yeah. So fa- so fast forward to yeah. today, and obviously. Yeah. 5G, so that's an integral part of you know Flow Flow Live and what you guys are doing. Clearly, there's so many benefits that people talk about 5G, and some naysayers, of course, right? Probably people that don't understand it. What are your thoughts on the 5G revolution, and, and how do you think it's going to transform mobile operators and people involved within IoT? I 
I think this really is sort of separated into two elements. I think the retail element and the fast speeds and, you know, getting the best sort of uh, uh, YouTube and your, you know, the best sort of video on your phone and high speeds. Like that. I think that's, that's one element of that. That's the retail element. Yeah. That's the human user element. I think the, the other part of it, which is uh, completely the, the side of the industrial part, the side of the, the enterprise part is very interesting. And this is where you know the interest comes in from other parts of the industry, from the cloud providers, from the uh, edge computing side, whereas mobile private network come into into play. And here, we're opening up an entirely different uh, industry. The industry where it allows you know fast, uh, low latency, sort of really uh, highly. High performance network, I would say. So high performance networks, localized. So we have some examples of um, of uh, the car industry. You know, in certain areas where they need to test certain things, they really need very low latency. The car can't really wait for uh, a core network that's, you know, uh, miles and miles away. It needs to be taken, you know, milliseconds. You know, yeah. a handful of milliseconds uh, decision making. So really, very low latency and security which is unparalleled. So that security needs to happen on site. Mm. I think this is where we're talking about edge computing mm. and whole industry that sort of jumped around this edge computing from the CPUs to the manufacturers of the, to, to you know, local clouds to uh, uh, virtualization sort yeah. of technologies all around the edge computer. And I think this is where we're bringing gaming or gamification or you know, industrial everything to the to the edge and where you you put the core network as part of that edge computing platform so the core network the packet gateways what we're very much used to seeing only at a mobile operator yeah. sort of uh, center we're now seeing at the edge compute environment so this could be at the enterprise it could be and even that is split into two. That's split into um, that's split into sort of a um, private radio, so mm. a private RAN mm. around that cloud computing environment around that site. So this is a single site. Could be a, a warehousing, manufacturing facility, retail facility, where all the devices in that in the environment are part of a private RAN. Yeah. It could be uh, from the security elements, sort of from, from cameras, door access, manufacturing, machines, uh, quality control, packing, all those devices being connected to a private RAN mm. uh, or private core network and, to, and the private RAN, so the private radio as well. Or the second element of that or the second flavor of that is having a private core network, however, using a public RAN. Right. So that means we're still using the radio access of the mobile networks, which is already deployed around that country, mm. around that geographical area, but we're using a private core network on site for that yeah. enterprise. Yeah. And that means that those devices can only connect using that core network, using that packet gateway, and that allows really a very unique work, let's say, a the policy that we could apply on security, on the internet connectivity from a local packet gateway. So that packet gateway, 5G terms, um, will really be controlling the access to the internet. What, where is it going? Does it need to go to the internet or is it just, does it need to go to the ERP systems of the business? So an example for that is, is the, ever-growing fleet management, logistics business, delivery business that we're seeing today. I think, you know, is it all part of that same, uh, that sort of, I would call it logistics 2.0, everything's happening in logistics, mm -hmm. where prior to that, you know, we, we would see, you know, the, the car, maybe uh, some facilities around the car having, uh, you know, controlling the location of, uh, of a delivery truck yeah. or the, you know, and are these and trends that you're seeing right now yes, in the industry? Absolutely, they're combined. They're, it's a combination of it. So now that combined, you know, facility of fleet management and delivery, you know, it's the same environment where the delivery driver yeah. is giving you 
a uh, something to sign on, a little tablet to sign on, but it's connected to the car as well, and the and the and to the insurance of how that driver is driving, and it's all sort of connected together. Yeah, and I think that's you know before that was a lot more fragmented. 5G brings it together. I mean, yeah, I think I think I think it's fantastic, and one of the things that I'm really um, kind of in favour on is that you mentioned security a few times there. Yeah. So often security is seen as an afterthought by many businesses and as, as, as a gold plating exercise that you'd come back and that you'd look at security. But it's nice to see that you've mentioned that early on yeah. in, in 5G cases and why that's important. What, I mean, why do you think the security and the privacy is something that's so paramount to, to 5G use cases? So let me maybe I should step back a little bit yeah. and explain a little bit about uh, about Flow Live yeah. infrastructure, and then we can derive that into the security. And what is it that we do? So the first, the reality is that is that Flow Live has today a global infrastructure of core networks that are spread around the world. So when uh, devices at the manufacturing level really don't need to know where they're going. Mm. where they're going to end up, how, where they're going to be deployed, which networks. And I think this is really the issues that the manufacturers have or the IoT industry has. It's not necessarily everything is planned. Whereas, you know, uh, human users uh, you know where, they're, where they live. They always sort of 90% of the time they're in one place. Mm. And however, this is where I always sort of said that IoT is global and... MNOs are local, and from a lo- from, and that kind of sums it all up, really, because when IoT is a global, it's a global product with a global service. Mm. A laptop doesn't know where it's going to end up. A car doesn't know, you know. The manufacturers really can't start planning where they're going to end up with their devices and where their where the car is going to end up. Do they have to plan ahead of time? Mm. Can they not shift some of the production to? Uh, somewhere else but yeah. you know there's a need so that single skew is very important for the manufacturing and I think that's where the industry came in with the eSIM with the UICC uh, however it's still required to have uh, individual carrier agreements um, and trying to figure those out for a manufacturer in every area of the world if it's a global player where they're going to have devices, agreements, every agreement's a little bit different, every integration with the carrier is a little bit different, everybody has a little different flavor, and still we're getting, you know, roaming started becoming a, a pretty much an impossible mission for global players because of uh, permanent roaming restrictions, mm-hmm. and then we see GDPR and privacy regulations that are coming in, and then there's data sovereignty around uh, around financial matters, uh, especially we see that in in Europe, so data needs to remain in the country. Mm. Uh, And then we have that in other countries where there's security issue, where the data needs to remain. um, We see that a lot in uh, in Brazil, in Turkey, in certain certain countries there where there is a regulation where the data needs to remain. So looking at all those constraints, but also an opportunity for uh, the manufacturers to deploy globally. And I think these are, this is one of the things that sort of stalled the growth in the industry was all these matters, you know, trying to do things that roaming wasn't just putting a, taking a SIM card from one MNO and hoping, you know, that it'll work everywhere else in the world. On top of all of that, IoT devices are not necessarily as strong mm. as mobile phones. We mm. forget that a mobile phone today is really a very powerful device, you mm. know, an extremely powerful CPU with has all the standards and, you know, it's been tested to every single, uh, to the extent of you know, every single eventuality. Whereas IoT devices are not. You're using, yeah. you know, uh, more economic chipsets that are destined for a specific purpose. Mm. Hence, they don't necessarily work in every scenario with every technology. Topping all of that, we also have the issue of the, you know, whether it's a low power, narrow band, battery operated, 5G, 2G, 3G, 4G, you know, there's all these different sort of mediums of technology. And we don't really know, that, you know, the end customer doesn't really know which networks are going to support which technology. Mm. So after this sort of you know semi-long introduction, 
this is where we we deployed our global core networks with you know we have our own infrastructure of, of uh, core network HLRs packet gateways uh, you know in all technologies from 2g 3g 4g low power narrowband and where the operators support those technologies we support them we and we have a uh, agreements with uh, many of the uh, tier one tier two operators around the world right and we have uh, integration with them uh, on a deep uh, core network level and when our customers deploy a device in that country they will authenticate on our infrastructure but they would also uh, use that radio access network from the carrier and they're getting that strength and uh, security that we were talking about. So yeah. going back to, looping back to your to your question, the security comes around when we are authenticating our customers' devices on our own infrastructure, on our own core networks, and monitoring that policy that they wanted uh, on that data yeah. network. So all the outbound to the internet or to their private uh, platform, to their private IT platform environments, we can now do that yeah. by deploying our software-defined connectivity. So it's all components. It's all each component is is separated, and it allows us to define what the customer needs. If they don't need uh, certain elements of that, or they would like part of their IT network to manage the data pass through, we would feed all the data from the, our packet from the packet gateway okay. directly to so, uh, so it's to modular so it's not so everything. it's completely modular yeah. and this is where you know it's very different from traditional core network vendors mm. uh, in the industry uh, not there's anything wrong with the traditional one yeah. but this is sort of completely software defined connectivity yeah. all the components are uh, you know without going into it it's all based on on uh, kubernetes and the yeah. modern day cloud-based environments where we could deploy parts in the cloud, parts in data center, uh, parts in the customer premises, you know, different components could be could be separated out. Yeah. Right? Give some I, examples I, of that. I think it's fantastic. You know, congratulations, right? You know, a little over five years having relationships with tier one and tier two operators across the world. For, for our viewers and listeners that don't understand the benefit of um, the operator is coming to you. What is the advantage in them doing that as opposed to trying to run something in the house? Is it a liability thing? Do you do you hold them harmless against any privacy or security issues? Curious to explore that. Uh, it's not necessarily a liability. I've never come across the liability question. I think uh, I think the benefits of um, uh, having a global IMSI library, as we call it. Uh, so uh, having all these carriers as part of the uh, FlowLab network, it really puts a lot of resilience into, uh, into the infrastructure. Yeah. So all our core network infrastructure, all our nodes around the world, whether it's US, East Coast and West Coast, in Europe and um, South Africa, we're now deploying furthermore in Australia, we have uh, Hong Kong. And so all these, uh, all these all these data networks are all our core networks are connected and they are um, sort of fail safe between them yeah and sort of what our customers get uh, really is that even if they're we're using one carrier one carrier seems in another country as part of the global network for example uh, one of our mobile network carriers has uh, estates in sort of you know in, in 15 different uh, states different countries then it would still allow us to use local packet gateways in each country so mm. in terms of local IP addresses and local this is really the benefits the latency is very low so they're getting a high performance network I think as part of um, maybe it's worth mentioning as part of the 5g architecture um, one of the technologies is uh, one of the outcomes is, is something called the control user plane separation the cups technology and this is something that we have uh, deployed across our network, which means that um, we will always use the closest packet gateway or a defined packet gateway. It doesn't have to go back to the packet gateway. Right, okay. You know, traditionally it was always one packet gateway was related to that single SIM card. Yeah. Um, and it was related to one core, one packet gateway. Now it could be, the core could be in one country and we would be using uh, uh, MNO 
in one country, but it's very beneficial to use that roaming for, you know, in, in another estate of that same carrier yeah. in a certain, in a different country. However, but to use a local packet gateway there or the closest packet gateway. So you're getting local IP addresses. It's very important yeah. for tablets, laptops, advertising, which relies on the time zones mm -hmm. uh, and definitely, you know, um, low latency, which is, you know, increasingly becoming important. So yeah. um, also from kind of tying back, looping back, you know, our, our technology is also on the SIM. So we have a SIM applet, which is very, okay. uh, which, you know, has our multi in the environment on that allows us to do some smart switching uh, to between different IMSIs on the SIM itself. And this is an app that we can uh, run as uh, in individually uh, on, on all uh, sort of SIM card platforms, but also as part of an EU ICC yeah. eSIM environment. Um, and I think this is sort of the strength is this ties back to our core network. So with our SIM app, with our core network infrastructure owned by us, there's less, um, there's a lot less room for, for outside interference. Yeah, um, because your core network infrastructure, you talk about all these different nodes. It's it's really global, isn't it? It's significantly grown in the last few years. Yes, absolutely. So it started. So we have uh, networks in the U.S. Uh, core network infrastructure in the U.S. in Europe, in Africa, um, Asia. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty much. Uh, I think our latest sort of now Latin America is where we're looking to okay. grow as uh, further nodes. But even in the U.S., we have more than one now. So East Coast and West Coast, we're growing into, and that's very important for us. Um, and and uh, and obviously, when when the business was set up, did you envision a path in which where you would grow and and in which order? Because that's that's always quite an interesting question because. Some, you know, some people want to, you know, take over Europe to start with, and then North America. But now you mentioned Latin America. Yeah, these are growth areas. Yes. Um, when we started, you know, we started where I think where the opportunities were, yeah. where the business was, where we had some customers. Um, the U.S. Uh, came as we grew our team in the U.S. We have a fantastic team uh, in the United States. Uh, led by Curtis Govan, who's the president of Americas, and um, and a fantastic team in Europe, and a fantastic team in in in, uh, in the APAC region. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, with uh, Benny Einhorn managing the uh, EMEA uh, region, and um, and uh, Dr. Wei Ming Li for the APAC region, and I think as they grew their teams, um, the opportunities sort of uh, came with that and we we developed the networks uh, and our nodes as the opportunities sort of uh, arise so I think it it sort of came hand in hand yeah, you know okay. uh, as the opportunities came as we developed our teams there uh, and as the networks uh, saw the opportunity in working with us so sort of that what our CEO uh, Anir Shalom always mentions is the flywheel sort of effect as we brought in more Customers from the from the device side, whether it was uh, uh, the laptops or tablets or industrial machinery or cars, uh, as those opportunities came along, the, the the networks we approached the networks and we said, look, we have these are the opportunities. These are sort of the large list of growing customers uh, that we started. I mean, the utilities came along, and healthcare mm -hmm. started developing. So. Hence, we wanted to, the operators had more interest to participate in our yeah. network. And I think today, you know, apart from a handful, you know, we are very much, uh, very well distributed around the world with, uh, with some fantastic uh, partners from the MNO side and uh, fantastic partners from the, from the hardware side, so all the, the manufacturing side. Um, and the utilities, that's going very well as well. So. I think it's a growing, you know, yeah. it's, it's definitely in the right direction. So the yeah. network is, the network is supporting the devices, and the devices are, and the network is really supporting the devices, supporting our our mm. carriers. Um, so most of our, I think, you know, it was a struggle maybe to explain the benefit to a carrier five years ago. Mm. 
Uh, I think it's a lot less of a struggle now. Yeah. It's very. We well, have so many use cases as well. Yes, right? exactly. So there's always, you know, today it's just evident. There's a lot of devices they need to connect mm -hmm. in your country. Would you, you know, would you be our partner? Yeah. And we bring a lot of benefit to 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 those carriers. And I think, you know, I think um, I actually heard uh, from someone else uh, that the, you know, how the low ARPU. Um, I think it was in one of your podcasts. Uh, how the low ARPU is really driving, uh, is really sort of creating a difficulty in the, in uh, the MNOs. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we are, the benefits to, to us working with the MNOs mm. is that we are, uh, you know, we already have uh, existing customers and those existing customers are already a, a revenue generator for our MNO partners. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic, and 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 going back to Flow Live, you know, obviously growing, expanding, had some VC, I believe, had some yes. rounds of funding as well. Yes, um, we had a, a round of a round of funding before, and I think uh, we can announce sort of in this podcast today that uh, we or uh, have a second sort of uh, addition to our B oh, round. Wow. Okay of uh, 15 million dollars and that's actually led by our existing investors however with a new uh, investor uh, being intel yeah and we're very proud and to and, and honored to have intel as our investor now it's that's really, fantastic you heard yeah. it heard it here first right yes i think so i, I think, think that's uh, an exclusive <laughs> it, it absolutely is that's amazing uh, so i think yes we're very honored to have intel uh as investors and that there are they are joining which which we sort of double our honor is that all our existing investors are participating in this round and I think having these uh, wonderful names we couldn't really ask for any more mm. uh, in terms of our, our investors of so being Intel Dell uh, Qualcomm as well right. so those three industry names alongside our VC uh, partners who really led and believed in the business uh, 83 North and Saban Ventures and I think we we've been very lucky and uh, appreciative and I think on the as as investors and as a board they are very supportive and uh, their insight is, is phenomenal to us so yeah. we, we've, we're really appreciative of that and it's a really a big vote of confidence yeah it must be because I think you know aside from the monetary investment it's the connections uh, the PR, the good relations that you have from from these silicon vendors as well, right? Investing and and putting uh, their name, you know, uh, aside the business. Absolutely, and I think you know it's also it's also driving the innovation, seeing where things are going, mm. where we are heading with this. You know, mm. Intel's a very strong player in the in the edge compute world, so understanding all that, where that five G is going, where we're going to end up with applications to 5g i'm sure there's a lot more smarter people than me about you know 5g applications and, uh, but being there with them you know on the connectivity side i think we have a fantastic partner and we can learn a lot from them and we can uh, hopefully assist uh do our best on the connectivity side to support their efforts as well so yeah it goes hand in hand what i've realized is you know from whether it's a dell laptop there's always a there's an Intel chipset inside and there's a module inside, but all these things have to come together and there's a general movement. You know, it needs to be, the energy needs to be driven in the right direction for yeah. it to happen. And I think uh, I've certainly enjoyed the process and uh, learned a lot from that and yeah. a lot from them as well. Yeah. So Ronnie, what's next for Flow Live in terms of the business growth and, and, and opportunity? What does that look like? I think we are, uh, we're here to to grow, grow dramatically. You know, we're here to to build more infrastructure. I think, I think Flow is a very unique sort of uh, uh, company in the sense that it's it's a service based company, mm. uh, offering you know based on large global infrastructure. That I'm not sure that there are many other uh, environments such as uh, Flow in terms of that sort of strength and global infrastructure out there. Um, I think we're going to grow uh, using this sort of uh, this investment that we've received now. Yeah, um, we're definitely going to strengthen our network car carrier network, strengthen our infrastructure, uh, further grow that physical infrastructure, 
I think there's a lot to do still with uh, with the cloud. There's mm -hmm. definitely more work to um, to grow within the existing public clouds. Um, I think they are converging as well. So that move between uh, telecoms and 5G being, you know, an IP sort of uh, technology and clouds is going to be. We're going to definitely see a lot of movement there. If you yeah. ask me. Uh, the world is moving towards a lot of these mini networks, cloud-based networks, things that you can sort of uh, build a, a core network, and, you know, just with a tick of a button yeah. uh, on a on a menu uh, screen. I think that's where we're going uh, with that. I think that's where we're going to see little mini networks that will uh, define networks that are really yeah. for for a specific use. Yeah. Um, and and there's going to be plenty and plenty of opportunities for that, plenty of use cases. You know, I think they will come from every sort of angle. Mm. Um, things that we may not even sort of maybe in the gaming world, maybe you know, mm. in the in the computer gaming world, maybe there'll be who knows. It's, yeah, yeah. There's going to be plenty of uh, fantastic opportunities. Obviously, alongside the more important ones like the you know the manufacturing and the agriculture yeah. and the, the smart city applications that we see mm. all around us. And you know, general digitization that we've seen from the COVID side, which has really accelerated it all, you know, the yeah. COVID environment. Yeah, and I think, yeah, possibly one of the one of one of the good things to come out from such a a horrible time for a lot of people, right? You know, increased digitization, etc. Yeah, so. absolutely. Though I think we've seen a lot of digitization uh, and quick yeah, digitization. Yeah. People yeah. had to quickly adapt. They had to quickly get their, you mm. know. I think you you know I, I always sort of say this as an example to people that really the reality is you can't really walk into a pub mm. without sort of now having your phone to scan the menu to scan where you are mm. you know this everything had to adapt you know yeah. the click and collect the delivery drivers are suddenly so sort of so much more effective you get yeah. text messages everything is around the logistics and you know I think if we hadn't had this we'd be a little bit uh, less digitized yeah. whether it's a good thing or a bad thing let's uh you know let's, it's not philosophical wait. about yeah, it yeah. but you know digitization definitely was sort of um left behind uh the companies that weren't there and they didn't sort of survive and the companies were the work sold you know everything from food to medicine to uh divide everything needed to, and i think we see this also in the payment systems now how everything is now available as a, as a card mm. payment because we mm. had to have card yes, payments. We couldn't indeed. use any cash yeah. for a period. Yeah. So all of that has as, uh, as sort of uh, pushed the, the innovation of, of payment mm. systems. I think even that we see a lot of, uh, a lot of our customers in that field as well. So yeah. Okay. Again, more private network, more you know, need for security, more need for... Um, quick deployments of devices that just show up in the field they just need to work yeah but they need to still be secure they still need to maintain that data in that country etc yeah absolutely ronnie we loved having yeah. you on the show thank you well, so much thank for you joining very much us. yeah thank honestly you. it's been really insightful it's great to meet you in person to do this in person after yes. such a long wait and uh you know very serendipitous that you you just so happen to be near uh near our offices when uh, when we started recording this so so thank thank you so much good luck in the future thank you very much i really appreciate it great show and great yeah thank i hope you. you guys continue doing a fantastic job with this it's really good thanks Excellent. for having me and if you'd like to find out more about the iot podcast show please check the link below and check the comments have a look at flow live get involved in the conversation sign up to the newsletter and we'll see you next time